This is Just a Thought, episode number 29, The Tiger Outside My Front Door. Hello, everybody. I am a day late today. I had a different podcast I recorded, and I was going to post it, and I just wasn't happy with it. (laughs) And I know I'm working on being terrible at posting even... No. I'm working on posting even when it's terrible (laughs) Um, because I'm practicing, but I just wasn't happy with that one. So I took it down and I decided to post this one instead today. So I want to talk about our brains. Our brains are awesome. They're hardworking. They're overachievers, always looking for problems to try and fix, which means if we aren't intentional, we'll always be focused on what's wrong. And what we don't have instead of being present and grateful and loving what we do have. It doesn't matter outwardly what we do or change. It's like walking through a door. We're the same person we were when we were outside, but now we've walked into a new place, new experiences, and maybe we have new perspective, a little bit more of an idea of what's possible for us. But the satisfaction really is in the journey. I found it doesn't matter what I have or what I do, it doesn't guarantee my happiness. Only I guarantee my happiness. And I don't actually want to be happy all the time. But even if I did want to be happy all the time, the things I do don't make me more happy. My thoughts, my beliefs, my attitudes, those are the things that make me happy or sad or scared. So... I have a very, very long list of things I'd like to change in my life. And if I had a magic wand, I would just start going down the list and I would make different things happen. I would stop complaining. (laughs) I would travel more. I would get paid to do what I love and I would make a certain amount of money. I would feel a certain way about my life. I would buy certain things. I would make changes. And I like to think improvements on my home and myself and my family and on the world and the people in it and what they choose to do or not to do. I like to make lists about all the things I want because it helps me hope and dream and it helps me to think about why I want to change all those things. I want my house to be clean and beautiful because I want to feel organized, creative, productive, and responsible. But interestingly, my house is cleaner than it's ever been and inside I still feel messy. I still feel disorganized. I still feel lazy and irresponsible. And the reason I feel that way is because of two things that are kind of the same thing. My thoughts and my brain. My thoughts are full of comparisons and judgments and I'm on this quest to prove myself to myself. And my brain is always looking for problems to fix. Once it fixes one problem, it looks for another. So unless I'm intentional about what problems I want to focus on, my brain will worry about whether my towels are folded as nicely as my friend's towels or whether my daughter's birthday party has enough healthy food and not too much sugar and that it's fun enough, organized enough, expensive enough, or frugal enough for all my friends whose children are coming to it who all have different thoughts and opinions and I want to please them all. And these problems stimulate the same emotions I would feel if there was a tiger outside my front door. I feel anxiety. I feel fear. I feel danger. Clearly, a tiger would be a bigger problem. But my brain is no respecter of problems. They're all the same to her. They're all a problem that needs to be fixed. I remember the satisfaction I felt when I got out of debt. Or when making my bed every day became a habit, or when I intentionally bought vanilla wafers and I watched Scamper the Penguin with my family while I ate the vanilla wafers because I had wanted to do that for years. The feelings I felt from doing all of those very different things were really similar and they all brought the same level of satisfaction and pride that we get from achieving a dream and doing what we set out to do. And these feelings lasted for about the same amount of time. I remember when we were $70,000 away from paying off our house. At the time, we only made $52,000 a year, and we had set a goal to have our house paid off in full by May of that year. Maybe it was June. Anyways, I could look it up, but I'm not going to. It doesn't really matter. The point was, 
We had hoped to have it paid off by a certain date, and that date was three months away. And I know I've shared bits of this story before, but paying off our house was one of the biggest things I've done so far that I really thought would make me feel a lot better, happier, and different than it actually did. <laughs> so it was three months till our gold deadline. I was sitting at a Jody Moore Be Bold event, and I was feeling really disappointed that we wouldn't make our goal. I was feeling like it was a big problem. There was no way we could pay off $70,000 in three months when we didn't even make that much in a year. And Jody Moore asked for a volunteer to be coach. So I raised my hand and with a shaky voice, I was feeling so much shame and embarrassment because I knew we couldn't reach our goal and I was feeling silly for making a goal that I wasn't going to achieve. And I was even more embarrassed to talk about it in front of a bunch of people I didn't know. And I made it mean a lot of negative things about myself and my husband. But honestly, looking back now, the only problem was what I was making it mean about me and my husband if we didn't achieve our goal by the date we had set, or even if we didn't achieve our goal at all. But Jody Moore opened the floor for coaching, so I raised my hand, and when she called on me, I told her what my circumstance was, I told her what the goal had been and where we were at, I told her my thoughts about it, and I will never forget the way she looked at me when I told her that I still really wanted to pay off the $70,000 in three months. But my husband only made $52,000 a year, and I only made about $20 on a good week cutting hair on the side while homeschooling our children. And everyone in the room laughed out loud. <laughs> but Jody didn't laugh. She looked at me with this excited, hopeful, even loving look. And I felt like her face reflected God's love for me. I felt like that's the way God would look at me. And she didn't laugh. She waited for everyone to quiet down. And then she told me that anything I want is possible. She told me to brainstorm every possible way I could think of to earn the money to achieve that goal. She said to even write down ridiculous things that I knew I actually wasn't willing to do, but could still be a way to make that money. She explained by facing my head in that direction focusing on what I could do, that action would get my brain in the right space to start generating the ideas to achieve the impossible. It's like the phrase, I think I said it earlier, by doing what's possible, we build bridges to doing what seems impossible. So I did it. And I no longer felt disappointed. I no longer felt broken. Somehow during that event, it finally clicked that failing or not paying off the house when we wanted to would be okay. It wouldn't mean anything about me or my husband or our worth or our ability to accomplish things. It would simply mean that we still had whatever amount left to pay off our house and we would still have a house. And that was it. But it was also possible to pay it off when we wanted to try. And to me, it was worth going for and felt like an exciting challenge. So even though nothing had changed circumstantially, in my mind, I felt peaceful and excited again. And after the brainstorm, I knew what we could do to get $70,000 to pay off the house. We could sell our current home and get a smaller one. We had talked about the idea before because at the time, Dave was in the process of losing his job and he was looking for a new one, but he hadn't been able to find one. And we started to feel like we might need to move somewhere else to get a job, but we wanted to have roots in St. George just maybe not attached to such a big house. We wanted something smaller that we felt like wouldn't cost a lot to maintain if we decided to rent it out. And interestingly, it was just what we needed to achieve our goal of getting out of debt and having a house paid off. So we did it. We put our house up for sale. It sold super fast. And then we had to find another place to live. <laughs> but luckily we just needed one house. And we found a wonderful one that we bought with cash. And sure enough, nine months later, we moved to Texas and rented that little house out. But what surprised me the most was how anticlimactic it all was, being out of debt and owning a home outright. Sure, we were out of debt, but that didn't guarantee our eternal or even lifelong prosperity and happiness. All it meant was we owned a house, which is cool. But suddenly we were already making new goals and having new dreams and wanting to change things and try for other impossible things. And it just kind of became normal to be out of debt. Something we had spent a decade of our lives scrimping, saving, and dreaming about. And just like that, we had it and moved on. 
sure we still benefit from the results of it, but my brain always has new problems available to focus on. I think of the Hans Christian Andersen story about a fir tree, so anxious to grow up, so anxious for greater things, that he doesn't appreciate his life or the moments he's in. He was the smallest tree in the forest and he feels embarrassed when a rabbit hops over him because he feels it means he's small and worthless instead of worthwhile and growing. And then a stork tells him of the older trees that were chopped down and used as ship masts and the little tree envies them and hopes he'll be cut down too so he can be admired and useful. But he's left to continue to grow to his shame and disappointment. Then in the fall, nearby trees are cut down and the sparrows tell him, that they saw these houses, they saw these trees being cut down and taken to houses and decorated inside. And one day, to his delight, this fir tree is cut down as a Christmas tree. Now he can finally be adored and useful. So he's carried into a house and he's decorated with candles and colored apples and toys and baskets of candy and a gold star is put at the very top of him. And in the morning, the children come and they take the candy and the gifts and the tree's disappointed again, but he figures they'll probably redecorate him soon enough. But instead, the servants take the tree down and carry him to the attic and leave him there. And he is lonely and disappointed. This was not how he wanted things to turn out. And in the spring, the fir tree, who's now withered and discolored, is carried into the yard and cut into pieces and burned. And that's the pitiful story of the fir tree's life. There are always at least two stories that we can have about the same circumstance. Sometimes there's way more stories than that. And one usually makes the central character a victim, whereas the other version can make them out as a hero. We tell ourselves stories all day. Be the hero of your stories. So how do we stop living and thinking like the fir tree, always focusing on problems, and instead become the hero? I like to, one, think of all the things I love about my life right now, right this very minute. I can even think of how things have been, things I've experienced, even if those are in the past. The second way is I plan little things I could try to change, things that I think would be fun to change. Life is challenging, if not always, at least sometimes. And I think it makes sense to strive to make it more easy and fun. But there's a trade-off. There are always twins to a stick. In order to make changes in life, we need to come face-to-face with disappointment. We might feel disappointed if we choose to get up and go for a walk instead of going back to sleep. But later, we might feel proud that we did get up and do what we said we'd do. And we would probably feel happier because of the chemical changes and hormones that getting up and moving and getting sunlight and fresh air gives our body. But if we choose to stay in bed, that might mean relief in the moment as we sink back into the warm coziness of sleep. But unless we choose to feel proud for sleeping when we're tired, we'll most likely feel disappointed that we didn't get up. How we choose to feel next is in our power. But for me, the most fun way to live is dreaming and hoping and planning and trying, but expecting to feel frustrated sometimes, expecting to feel disappointed. One thing we can know, no matter what the circumstance we are in, we'll have a full plethora of emotions and problems available. Oh, to live the life we dream by loving the life we are living, instead of letting our brains go rampant in the middle of a plethora of problems that will never end. So, that's why I recommend making small changes. Get up and go running today. It'll bring you the same level of satisfaction as running a marathon would next year. And it's so much easier to do now. And if you do it today and feel the satisfaction, chances are you'll be willing to do it tomorrow too. And maybe the next day. And these little possible steps you take right now are the bridges to the seemingly impossible steps you'll take later. This is Christina Stead. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a disciple of Jesus Christ. He loves me, he loves you, and he loves us. This is a podcast for parents willing to change their mind and change their lives. This is just a thought.